around a new supply of chocolate. So it's, um, if you've been saving up your questions, this is the time to ask them. Um, So let's just review quickly what um, what we found last time. We found that um, the first order correction uh, trying to get these things organized here. Um, well, it's certainly true that the first order correction to the energy of the uh, nth level is simply, this is a non-degenerate perturbation theory, is simply the, um, the mean value of the perturbation in the, uh, in the um, uh, nth level. And uh, on the other hand, the uh, first order correction to the state is um, a projection operator that projects onto everything except N0 divided by En0 minus H0 times um, the potential times N0. And then we found that delta 2 N um, was uh, the sum K not equal to N, VKN squared over PN0 minus EK0. And writing this, this would be a sum over K not equal to N. And it would then be a K0. And then a K0 VN0, which we could call VKN. And then it would be divided by En0 minus Ek0. So that's uh, the first order correction to the state. And what I should say is that although that's the first order correction to the state, there's a um, there's a a lambda in there in that um, the state n is n0 plus lambda. Um, and also the, the, ch the change in the energy EN minus EN zero is um, de lambda delta N one plus lambda squared delta N two. Okay, so that's our review of the uh, of the uh, non-degenerate perturbation theory. And um, we want to apply that to an example. In the example, I've got so many notes here, all sort of mixed up. Um, right. So we were doing the quadratic uh, uh, Stark effect on the ground state of hydrogen. And And so here what we've got is we have H0 is P squared over 2 mu minus E squared over R. So that's the that's the, um, the problem that we can solve. And then the potential V, or rather lambda V, is E P Z. So it's just an electric field in the Z direction. And now as we look for the lowest order correction over here, we see that that actually vanishes because 1, 0, 0, Z, 1, 0, 0 is 0. That's because this 1, 0, 0 state is perfectly symmetric on Z, obviously, and plus at positive Z, negative, or negative Z. And um, so we're going to then to the second correction, and if we use this formula over here, 
we see that the second order of correction, D2100, is then E squared, E squared. And what I actually see is that we sort of um, lapsed in the notation here. In other words, we sort of absorbed the lambda squared in, uh, into the delta. Anyway, so this is the actual change in the energy. We, we, we don't need to add lambda. This is actually lambda squared, delta squared. Is E, E squared um, times the sum N not equal to 1, all L and M. N, L, M, Z, 1, 0, 0, squared, divided by E, 1, 0, minus E, uh, N, 0. And because this is uh, hydrogen with its uh, atomic hydrogen uh, with its um, hidden symmetry, the, uh, the L independence is not present. Okay. And just to remind you, can you see what I write? You can see what I write here, I guess. Um, EN0 is equal to minus EI, the ionization energy over N squared, and that's equal to minus a half uh, mu C squared alpha squared over N squared. So that's the um, <clears throat> that's the uh, that's what we have to compute. Now the electric dipole moment D is for any state psi is minus E R inside. Here, we're taking E to be positive. There are two conventions. One E is positive, the other one E is negative. I think the E positive convention is winning. But anyway, um, we now look at our expression over here for what N is. We see that um, uh, A this N will be N0 plus lambda N1, and that's going to be N0 plus lambda. The projection operator for everything, everything except the N state, EN0 minus H0, PN0. So that's just recapitulating what we had there. And so this state uh, psi, is then one zero zero, the ground state of atomic hydrogen, and then it is plus E E sum N not equal to one, all L and M, N L M, N L M, Z one one zero zero ground state, and we're dividing by E one zero minus E. N0, EN0 being this expression here. Is that a question? Right. Okay, so now we have to um, take the matrix element of D in the state. And so what we get is D is equal to, and so it would be, I'm going to write as a big bracket here, 100 zero, zero plus E. E sum n not equal to one, and then it's going to be one zero zero z n l m n l m e one zero minus e n zero minus e r. And then over here, we're going to have uh, one zero one zero zero plus e e sum 
and maybe I should say N prime not equal to 1, L prime, M prime, N prime, L prime, M prime, N prime, L prime, M prime, Z, 1, 0, 0, over E1, 0, minus E, N0. Okay, so that's the expression. And um, the biggest term would come from the 1, 0, 0 diagonal element. That's 0. So that's gone. And so then what we have is a cross term of Z and E1. And then the other term, the other cross term, 1, 0, 0 minus ER, and then all of this. And what you can see is that uh, that just contri that contributes a factor of 2, which somehow escaped from my notes. So there's a type on my notes. I mean, uh, you know, just Okay, so let's look at some of these. We yet now need to evaluate these matrix elements that occur here. Um, the, uh, the Z1 and then the R between uh, 1, 0, 0 and NLM. So first of all, NLM Z, 1, 0, 0. What about this? Well, there are various ways of thinking about it, but um, let me give you a fundamental way of thinking about it. You can stick in here, NLM, you can stick in the identity in the following form. E to the I theta J3 over H bar, E to the minus I theta J3 over H bar, Z. One zero zero. This is a rotation about the z-axis by angle theta. When it hits z, it doesn't do anything because z is pointing in the z direction. When it hits a spherically symmetric state, it doesn't do anything. So this has no effect. On the other hand, this one on this one is um, e to the i e to the i m theta over, in fact, not even over h bar because it's an eigenstate. This is an eigenstate of J3 with eigenvalue mh bar. And so this is E to the I m theta times m l m z 1 0 0. So this goes away, it doesn't do anything. So now we have that this is equal to this for arbitrary theta. So you said, so if m is not equal to 0, you can just set theta equal to um, pi over m as an angle, and then you get e to the i pi times this thing, which is minus this thing. So, so we have that this is equal to minus itself, and then you add it, add this to both sides, and you get twice this equals zero. So this thing is equal to zero. NLM Z one zero zero equals zero for um, M not equal to zero. There are other ways of seeing it. In the notes you have a simpler description, but it's better, I think, to think of these more fundamental ways of looking at things. Now what about X and Y? Well, the same thing could be said for x and y. Um, uh, oh, well, let, let, me, let me give you the other way of looking at x and y. x and y are proportional to linear combinations of y1 plus or minus 1. So if you have something like n, l, m, x, 1, 0, 0. 
This is spherically symmetric. So this whole thing is proportional to y1 plus or minus 1. So that then tells you that if this is a, this is an m, this effectively is m equal to plus or minus 1, then m here, if m is 0, you're going to have no contribution. And so this is going to be saying that n, in fact, just nl0, x1, 0, 0, is 0, and also nl0, y1, 0, 0, equals 0. If you wanted to do these in a different way, well, it would be a little tricky, actually. I suppose this is the easier way to do this. All right, are there any questions about that? Remember, I do have a trouble in my right pocket. OK, all right, well, let's take this matrix element, then, and see what we get. What we get, then, in particular, if we run E as D times Z hat, then what we're going to get is, first of all, that, let's see. This one over here says, this one says that M has to be 0. So then if M has to be 0, the x and y is going to vanish. So in other words, we have a, I think I should do this more slowly. What we have here is 1, 0, 0, Z, and NLM, NLM, R, 1, 0, 0. This condition over here says that this is going to be 0 unless M is 0. So that tells me the only thing that survives is 1, 0, 0, Z, NL, 0, NL, 0, R, 1, 0, 0. But then these relations tell you that because this is 0, the x and y go away. And so this goes down to 1, 0, 0, Z, NL, 0, NL, 0, Z, 1, 0, 0. So this means that the only component of R that survives is the Z component. And that's why D is proportional to Z. And moreover, once this happens, you see that this is just the absolute value squared of 1, 0, 0, Z, NL, 0, squared. So this thing that starts out looking fearsome and complicated because of these, I guess, orthogonality relations and selection rules collapses into something very simple. And the something very simple then is that the magnitude of the electric dipole moment is minus 2 E squared E. So note, one factor of E from here, one factor from here. And of course, I'm neglecting the inner product of the complicated sum R complicated sum. That's more complicated to evaluate, but it's higher order in E. It's proportional to E cubed. And E is a small number, so we can neglect that. Oh, there's something else that I have to say here. And there's another selection rule. So I'm going to write this as an L to begin with, because that's as far as we've gotten. E. OK, so that's our sum at this point, our formula for the electric dipole moment. Now, let's imagine actually doing this integral. 
Well, this is a spherically symmetric function. And uh, so the angular integral is going to be d omega, which means, of course, d phi sine theta d theta. This is going to be a Legendre polynomial. In fact, it's just PL. In fact, when this is the phi, let me let me write this as an integral of the x from minus one to one and d phi from zero to pi. And it's going to be PL of x because m is zero. This is going to be P1 of x. And and that's it. So the d phi just contributes two pi. And now we have an integral from minus one to one of PL of x with P1 of x. Well, these things were orthogonal polynomials, Legendre polynomials. And um, in fact, you can construct the Legendre polynomials, curiously enough, by just saying, just take, take, taking the polynomials x to the n and requiring them, these polynomials x to the n, of course, are not orthogonal. But you say, well, let's apply the Gram-Schmidt process, the Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization process to these polynomials and pick, make them orthonormal at the interval minus one to one, which is the integration of the unit sphere. And that gives you the Legendre polynomials. Normalization. Anyway, so this tells us that this is proportional to delta L1. So this L here is only one, so I can get rid of this with L. So this is a more a simple expression. So it's just to sum over the piece states. Are there any questions? Things pretty well. Parking type is means that you have to do 
form percentage rather than class form percentage. Um, anyway, this quantity alpha is dimensionless. It's E squared over H bar C. And if we substitute that in there, then let me skip one line in the notes because it will take us too long. 4 H bar squared over mu E squared sum n greater than 1 n 1 0 z 1 0 0 squared over again 1 minus 1 over n squared. Alright, the next point is to say, well, we don't really need to compute this thing. Uh, uh, you can get an upper bound on this. And so so what we do is we say 1 over 1 minus 1 over n squared is less than or equal to 1 minus 1 over a quarter. In other words, n equals 2. If you go to n equals 3, then, um, then this thing becomes closer to 1. Um, Yeah, that's right. Um, no. Well, let's see. As you take n to infinity here, this goes directly to 1. And this is, well, that's right. This is um, uh, 3 quarters, so 4 thirds. So indeed, 1 is less than 4 thirds. Yes, this is what Somehow I'm not. This is, of course, four thirds. And um, this one, for n equal to 1, of course, it's infinity. For n equals 2, you have equality. But for n equals 3, it's 1 minus 1 9. So it's 8 9. So it's 9 over 8, which is less than 4 over 3. All right. So what we can do then is we can approximate, we can get an upper bound for the sum. say pi uh, is less than or equal to um, 4 h bar squared over e, e squared 4 thirds sum n greater than 1 1 0 0 z and I'm going to write this now states here and increase the size of the right hand side, we'll get a weaker inequality, a weaker upper bound. And so we can say this is less than or equal to 16 over 3 h bar squared over mu e squared. But now it's the sum not simply over n greater than 1 and L equal to 1 and n equal to 0, but we can say it's over n, all n ln n y. All n ln 1, 0, 0, z n ln n ln z 1, 0, 0. And all these terms are positive because they're just the absolute value squared 1, 0, 0, z n ln. But now this is the identity operator. So this is less than or equal to 16 over 3 h over plus squared over mu e squared 1, 0, 0. Z squared 1, 0, 0. Okay. Right, now, for goodness sakes, ask a question. This, is, this, is, this illustrates some of the nice things that can happen in we have the calculations to reduce 
something that would be hopelessly complicated to something fairly simple by using the completeness of this and replacing the sum over dyadics just by the identity of it. Of course, the fact is that in order to get from here to here, I have to toss in also the continuum states. All right, now this is, now, um, eventually, of course, we have to do an integral. We can't just fool around with general principles all day long. So we have to do an integral at some point. So let me just to conserve board space, start over here. What is this 1, 0, 0, z squared 1, 0, 0? Uh, well, obviously, it's a third. 1, 0, 0, r squared, r vector squared, 1, 0, 0, because the grand state of hydrogen is spherically symmetric. Okay, well this one uh, is just simply one third. Remember the spherical harmonic part of the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen atom wave functions are themselves separately normalized over the omega. And so all we have to do is integrate over r, 0 to infinity, r squared dr, r1, 0 squared of r, and now r squared. So this is the volume element, this is the r squared that comes from here. And that is equal to 4 over 3 the Bohr radius to the minus three third power, that comes from the normalization here of R10. And it will zero to infinity. Dr, R to the fourth, and then this R10 squared just contributes e to the minus two R over A0. So now we let um, we let x equal 2r over a0 and change variables. And this um, turns into uh, a0 over 2 to the fifth, because we've got a1 here and 4 there. Uh, 4 over 3, a0 cubed in the denominator. And then we go 0 to infinity. X, x to the fourth, e to the minus x. Of course, it's a famous integral, and it gives you um, four factorial. And so, all together, then, this thing is 16 over 3, a bar squared over mu e squared times. Well, I should, I should actually put the four factorial here. So this is a0 squared over 2 to the fifth, 4 over 3, 4 factorial. And now, if you work that out, everything cancels, it turns out, except for the a0 squared. So this gives you a0 squared. And so this is a0 squared. Um, and in fact, this is a zero. So this is 16 over 3 a zero cubed. And uh, that's about 5.3 times a zero cubed. The exact answer for pi 1s, the ground state for electric such that really is 4.5 times a zero cubed. So you see this is a pretty reasonable, a pretty good approximation. In other words, it's an upper bound indeed, but um, it's, it's much better than an order of magnitude. It's off by, I think it's off by less than 20%. Okay. So. And I guess, how could you have done it better? Well, uh, it, it would 
not be that hard, for example, to compute this for the people's one state, say for the, do this for any, do it exactly for n equal 2. And, well, I don't know. I thought I saw a way of approximating it a little bit better, but I'm not sure. Okay, so that's the quadratic Stark effect in hydrogen, ground state of hydrogen. Are there any questions? All right, the next topic is degenerate perturbation theory. We already did, frankly, about as much about degenerate state perturbation theory as you find in most textbooks. But I'm going to try to give you a description of the degenerate case that's a little better than that. It turns out this is not a complete description either. The degenerate state perturbation theory can really be a mess. So we're going to, do you remember what I told you was the basic way of, let me review what we're going to be doing for degenerate state perturbation. So we have H, H0 plus lambda B. And the question is, what do you do for, what do you do in non-degenerate perturbation theory? Well, in non-degenerate perturbation theory, you just say that the mean value, you just write down the nth level. The mean value of the Hamiltonian in the nth level is N0, H0 plus lambda B, N0. And this gives you EN0 plus lambda N0 B, N0. So that's what you do in non-degenerate perturbation theory. This is a real mess, isn't it? But now in degenerate perturbation theory, what you've got is several different eigenvectors of H0 that have the same energy levels. And so what you do effectively is you, instead of having N0, you then have N0 I. And so you can imagine that the eigenstates, the lowest eigenstates of H are going to be, how shall I write them? In N1, well, I'll write them as, I'll write them in here as L0. And they're going to be a sum on, they're going to be a linear combination of all of the states. In other words, we have G sub N states that are degenerate here, these N0 comma I, such that H0 on N0 comma I, they're all E N0, N0 comma I. So that's the degeneracy. And so this thing here is a sum I equals 1 to G sub N. G sub N is the degeneracy of the nth level. And so then we just write the eigenvalue equation. And this eigenvalue equation is simply, let us say, H on L0 is going to be E N L. L0. And now when L0 acts on this, you're going to have H0 plus lambda B acting on the sum here of N0 I, N0 I, 
L0, and these guys are all going to give a value of EN0, and then plus lambda V on this sum, N0I, N0I, L0s. And so if we just subtract E0 from both parts, we're going to say then that the NL1 contribution on L0 is going to be lambda V sum here N0I. I did this last time, I'm just going to be doing L0. And now taking the inner product from the left, with respect to say N0I, what we get is E1 NL N0I L0 is lambda V N0I L0. Whoops, well that was a big mistake, big mistake. This obviously is an operator, so this really is lambda N0, well it's going to be a K, N0K V N0I N0I L0. So it looks like that, and of course we still have the sum over I. Okay, so this is an eigenvalue equation then of the form lambda V KI L, I don't know, times N0I L0 is equal to E1 N L N0K L0. So this is the, this is a matrix equation then that, this of course is the sum over I. So this is that this lambda times the square matrix V times this column vector L0 say is equal to E1 NL times this column vector E L0. This is what we worked out before. So the first thing to do then is to diagonalize the square matrix and find these separate eigenvalues. And so that's the first order to generate a perturbation theory. Now, there are of course two cases. One is that the, that this perturbation V is sufficiently asymmetrical that it completely breaks the symmetry in the symmetry of H0, at least for the nth level. And so that you get, that you get as eigenvalues here from this G by G equation, you get G different eigenvalues. So you completely break the symmetry. Then there's the other case. The other case is you don't completely break the symmetry. And in the case where you don't completely break the symmetry, you're kind of stuck. And you have to, I don't know of any way of really, I don't know quite how to proceed, although the method I told you last time where you just truncate the system to some n by n system, compute all the matrix elements laboriously, and then just apply linear algebra and diagonalize H, that's, that of course will always work, but it's, it can be extremely laborious. So we're going to assume for the rest of this treatment of degenerate state perturbation theory that we're dealing with a level and a potential such that this procedure here breaks the degeneracy and gives us, in other words, instead of having G and eigenvectors all with the same energy, E and zero, that we now have G and levels L zero, so 
L0 by pole. L0 should, well, L0, where L goes from 1 up to Gn, and these energies, E, N, and L, are all different. So you have G different, E sub N different energies. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Another way of thinking about this is to introduce a projection operator onto the set of E sub N set of eigenvectors of H0. So, in other words, we have H0, N0, is E degenerate 0, N0. So these are the G sub N degenerate eigenvectors. States. So we start out with these G sub N degenerate states, and we have a projection operator onto this subspace. And what I describe here, as kind of a tangent, is the procedure of diagonalizing P0, V, P0. In other words, we truncate the operator, the potential V, just to the subspace spanned by these G N degenerate states. We call this V D. I'm not confused with medical condition. Now, there's another projection operator that we're going to be talking about, namely P1, which is the identity operator, minus P0. And now, is that a projection operator? Well, you know the rule for a projection operator is to square it. So P1 squared is 1 minus P0 squared. And so that's 1 plus P0 squared minus 2 P0. But P0 is a projection operator, so P0 squared is P0. So this is 2 minus 2 P0. Wait a minute, I've got this wrong. So, please excuse me. This is 1 plus P0 minus 2 P0, so this is 1 minus P0, which is equal to P1. So in other words, P1 squared is P1. So P1 is the projection operator onto the space that is not everything except the space spanned by the degenerate states. So this is another projection operator. Now, what we want to solve is the equation 0 equals E minus H0 minus lambda V L. And we imagine that as lambda goes to 0, the state L is going to go to L0, L0 being the eigenstates of this truncated potential. All right, is that clear what we're doing? This gets worse. I'll just tell you, this gets to be very complicated. And the amazing thing is that if we don't have the case where all the levels of the arm are, in other words, where the potential removes the degeneracy by virtue of its asymmetry, the thing is this method just completely breaks down. So what we're going to do is we're going to write, we of course have a rule that 1 is equal to P0 plus P1. And so we're going to take this identity operator and stick it right there. And that's going to give us the following. It's going to give us 0 equals E minus H0 minus lambda V times P0 L plus E minus H0 minus lambda V 
this is rel hard. I'm proving it in a different way. 1 minus p0, so this is minus h0, p0, and we know that's 0. And so when we multiply this equation from the left by p1, what we get is that the p1 hitting e minus ed and then hitting p0 gives us 0. So we just get 0 equals minus lambda p1 v p0 l. And then we have a p1 here. But for these two terms, there's already a p1 here, so that just gives you p1 squared. So this one just changes by e minus h0 minus lambda p1 v p1 l. Okay, so that's the second. So we have two equations now. This one, which we can call equation 2, and this one, which we can call equation 1. So we've got this eigenvalue equation, and we split it up into two separate equations. Okay. Now, let me just illustrate which one we're dealing with. As I said, this is pretty confusing. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to take the second equation, and we're going to say that we can invert this operator. Now, why can we invert this operator? Well, it's sitting with a p1 here. So we could, in fact, insert another p1 there gratuitously, because the only thing that just makes this p1 squared, and that's no different since it's a protraction operator. Now, what does this tell us? This is the Hamiltonian, but with a p1 on both sides. And because it has the p1 on both sides, it's only the states that are not in the degenerate level. And so the eigenstates here are going to be, there's going to be a big gap, because all the eigenstates of this operator are essentially, are separated by the splits between the degenerate levels. In other words, we have gn levels here, and maybe gn prime levels here, and gn double prime levels up there. The splitting between the sets of degenerate levels is big, and that's what is in here. So we can invert this. And when we invert it, what we get is p1 l is equal to, so we just multiply by this operator inverse on both sides of the equation, and what we get is that this is equal to this divided by that. And since there's a p1 here, we can multiply by an extra p1. So we have a p1, we have a lambda over e minus h0 minus lambda p1 v p1. Now times this over here, which is p1 v p0 l. Okay, so that's our expression for that. And that's a little more complicated than we need, but anyway, what we're going to say then is that l is equal to l0 plus lambda l1 plus dot, dot, dot. And so, yes. So p1 l is just, p1 is going to give 0 on that. So this is simply lambda p1 l1. And p1 l1 is effectively then from this equation, this is going to be p1 lambda over e minus h0 p1 v p0 l0. So in other words, we keep this, but we're going to toss this out because this would only contribute more to lambda squared. 
So more simply then, we've got the P1, L1 is the sum K0 in this degenerate energy level, K0, K0, V, L0 over ED0, I don't know if we can get a zero here, over E minus K0. In other words, we've inserted here what actually P1 is, and P1 commutes with H0. So this thing, once you express P1 as the sum over K0 dynamics, this thing simplifies quite a bit. So that's actually the hard part of the thing. And equivalently, we can write this as the sum K0, V, K0, V, K0 over ED0 minus K0. Notice that this is connecting states K that are not in the degenerate level to states L in the degenerate level, or to the state in the degenerate level. The state that diagonalizes, the state that we found in the first order degenerate relation. And now we want to find P0, L. And so what we do is we take this equation here, and we put it into equation 1. In other words, this equation here. So we take that and we put it in there. In other words, we substitute for this right-hand side here. And when we do, we get a pretty complicated equation, keeping in mind, though, that P1 and P0 are orthogonal. What we get is 0 equals minus lambda P1, V, P0, L, plus P minus H0 minus lambda P1, V, P1, L. I'm sorry. I completely screwed up. I copied down the wrong equation. We substitute. Yeah, we get something much more complicated. 0 equals part of the thing. What we're getting is E minus E, D0 minus lambda P0, V, P0, L, minus lambda P0, V, P1, lambda, over E minus H0 minus lambda P1, V, P1, P1, V, P0, L. Okay, so in other words, we're substituting this expression here into equation 1 over here on this side. And so we repeat all of this, which is there. And then we repeat this structure. But then P1, L gets turned in, gets, becomes a flat form. So that's our expression. And now we can see that we've got a P0, L as a common factor. So we can write this as 0 equals E minus E, D, or E, D0, minus lambda P0, V, P0, minus lambda squared P0, V, P1, 1 over E minus H0, minus lambda V, P1, V, P0, all on P0, L. Obviously, we're going to ignore that in a moment. Now, if we look at this to order lambda, well, when we get rid of all this complexity, and we just have the very simple equation 0 equals E minus E, D, minus lambda P0, V, P0 on 
P0L. Well, this is just the lowest order equation that we were solving over there and that we solved on Monday. So this just says that the lowest order, the eigenstate in the subspace, is just obtained by diagonalizing the potential within the subspace. Okay. Now we're going to approximate this equation by using the eraser. Obviously, we don't want anything to order when the cube did here. This thing is complicated enough. So we just get rid of that. Because, you know, 1 over something plus epsilon is 1 plus epsilon. Okay, we have this equation. And let's suppose that the eigenvalues of this, the eigenvectors of this equation are L0I. That is to say, P0V, P0 on P0, LI0 is VI, P0, LI0. So these are these eigenvectors that we were finding over there and finding on Monday for degenerate state. In other words, this is the square matrix. This is the eigenvector. That's the eigenvalue. Then these eigenvalues E1 are ED or ED0 plus lambda VI to first order. Now what we're going to do is we're going to effectively apply non-degenerate perturbation theory to each of these levels. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to say that we have a script V. So this effective script V potential is the thing we find in here. This script V potential is going to be lambda squared P0V, P1, 1 over ED0 minus H0, P1, V, P0. So that's this structure here. And this thing is going to be already H0. So this is going to be E minus H0 effectively. In other words, script H0, script H0 is going to be the ordinary H0 plus lambda P0, V, P0. So now what we have is effectively an expression for, we have non-degenerate perturbation theory for each of these distinct levels split by this operator. And now we have, this is our potential and this is our known Hamiltonian. And so what we use is that the first order correction is what I call P sub N over E N0 minus script H0, V, script V on N0. And this P sub N is the sum J not equal to I, LJ0, LJ0. So this is a projection operator within the subspace, but on states that are just different from the ith one. And so then that tells us that P0, LI1, using this expression, is the sum, oh my goodness, we're just about out of time, we're out of time, J not equal to I, lambda squared P0, LJ0, LJ0, V, P1, 1 over ED0 minus H0, P1, V, LI0. And there's also a factor over here, which is ED0 plus lambda VI minus ED0 minus lambda VJ. All right.
right, so this is sum k not equal to i lambda p0 lj0 lj0 v p1 1 over e d0 minus h0 p1 v l i0. And let me write it one more time. p0 l i1 is the sum k not equal to i lambda p0 lj0 over v i minus v j sum k not equal to d lj0 v k0 1 over e d0 minus e k0 k0 v lj0. All right, so that's, I think we better stop here because we're sort of at the end of the hour. We're way at the end of the hour. Are there any questions? Remember, I've got all this talk. This, frankly, I find very complicated and hard to follow. So, and also, as I said to you, it only works if the degeneracy splits, if the perturbation completely splits the states in the degenerate level. Anyway, it's basically all in the notes. So, we have a two, we have now a break because I'm not going to be here next week. And then when I get back, I'll try to finish this and I'll finish this and then go on to do some applications. I put the homework on the web page. If you think the homework is too difficult, let me know. But I think in the problem that is, well, I don't know, just send me an email and I'll give you hints. I did put some hints. And one of the problems, which is very long, for many parts, is an easy part and a hard part, an easy part and a hard part, an easy part and a hard part, an easy part and a hard part. So, without working very hard, you should be able to get, without even thinking, you should be able to get half of the hard, half of the long problem. Thank you.